I recognize His Excellency Jibanis Shonekon and every other person in this room. So my one disclaimer, and this is for all politicians, is that if I do not call you by name, I'm not talking to you. So if you think I'm <laughs> so if you think I'm talking to you, you're just thinking it. Okay, so um, in 2015, and I'm not about Nigeria, take the whole world. In 2015, according to Oxfam, 62 individuals, 62 individuals owned more than half of humanity. The wealth in the hands of 62 individuals was higher than the total wealth in the hands of the bottom 50% of the world's population. The 1% of the richest people in the world collectively own more than the 99% below them. So America took about a Gini coefficient. And you can think about that in Nigeria. In an era where we're growing, where we're producing billionaires and people going on the Forbes list and counting ourselves among prosperous nations, actually had a situation where a famous politician who is unnamed uh, said said that a mark of the economic prosperity of this country was the number of private jets we had. It's the elite mindset. Now, let me tell you a story. When I became Amir, and this was within the first six months of being Amir, and every day I deal with these issues, people come in, uh, some want help for medical uh, assistance, some want to... Uh, someone support for education, someone food, and so on. And usually, there, there's a time for, for those appeals after uh, we've taken the communication from the districts. And on this day, while taking the letters from the districts, I heard this big scream from a lady who was waiting behind. And I said, go and check what is happening. And when they checked, they found that this woman waiting for her turn to ask the Amir for assistance while waiting there, her baby died. And her baby died because she had come to the Amir to appeal for assistance. She needed 3,000 Naira to buy drugs. Context, that is much less than $10. Now for me, coming from the central bank, I've been an Amir. I came face to face for maybe the first time in my life with what it means when we say X percent of Nigerians are living on less than $1 a day. It means that for those people, their children die every day because they cannot afford 3,000 Naira drugs. 3,000 Naira. They don't have access to antenatal care. They have no access to immunization. If they get malaria, that's a death sentence. Their daughters get taken out of school. 75% of adolescent girls in the Northwest are married. We have the highest rate of VV fistula in the world. I've heard this figure about 62% of Nigerians living in poverty. But just as you look at inequalities vertically, you must also look at inequalities horizontally. And I'm coming down to the question of prosperity and peace. 62% of Nigerians, or maybe 40%, depending on what you look at. But break down those numbers. In Lagos State, the poverty rate is 8.5%. In Zamfara, it is 91%. In Kano, it is 77%. In Yobe, it is 90%. And demographically, these are the most populous parts of this country. So think through those numbers and put human beings behind those numbers. And then ask yourself, how many Nigerians out of this 170 million 
are living on less than one dollar a day, where do they live and is there likely to be peace and stability in those areas in the future? It's simple. Until we begin to think of economics, not in terms of GDP, inflation, reserves, but in terms of how many human beings are able to eat three square meals a day. How many young people have an education? How many people have an opportunity in life? We can never have peace. Nigeria is a country today with 170, 180 million people. The median age is 19. In the next 20 years, you will have at least 85 million Nigerians between the ages of 20 and 40. That is the population of Germany, the third largest economy in the world. 85 million. What economy are we building for those people? And that's why when you think um, of all the things we've heard today, it comes back to challenging the way we've been taught to think about economics. And also challenging as bankers, and I, I'm a guilty person, I mean, I, I run a central bank on the basis of classical neoliberal macroeconomic theory. I apologize for any damage I've caused. Um, but the point remains, look at all the ideological conversations in the world which no longer happen. Take the debate on migration. We've all joined it. Migration is bad. Africans are migrating to Europe. Bad for who? Bad for Africans or bad for Europeans? When Africans were taught to migrate in the 17th century, held in chain and put in ships and taken to plantations to work as slaves, was that bad? When Europeans migrated to Algeria and Tunisia and South Africa and Nigeria and set up colonies and settler colonies and apartheid systems, that was migration. Why wasn't that bad? Don't we realize that Africans are migrating to Europe because of the world in which we have created? We've signed up global agreements. And America would be a strong supporter of the free movement of capital across borders, bring in capital and repatriate it. And I've been an ideological supporter of that. You're a strong supporter of free movement of goods and services across markets. Why is it so good for capital to move in and out, for goods to move in and out, for raw materials to go and fish goods to come, but so bad for human beings to go and share in the prosperity of those countries? Why is it okay for you to sit in New York and London and bring in X billion dollars into the Nigerian capital market, buy shares, buy currency, make profit, take it back, but bad for the Nigerians to follow that money and try to share in that prosperity. It's a conversation we must have. The global agreements we have signed, the ideology we have signed up to, we're playing a game, we say it's a level playing field. Fine. Take the Nigeria under 16 football team, put them on a playing field with the Brazilian national team. The field is level. Who wins? Who wins? You cannot have a level playing field when you sit down and sign up to agreements that were designed and fashioned by partners in an unequal relationship. So where to begin? So where to begin, and all of us are all living in this post-colonial mindset, is to begin to ask ourselves where, as Africans and as Nigerians, where we are actually even, whether we're actually even thinking independently. And what will help us think independently is to continue asking that basic question in every economic statistic we look at, in every transaction we go into, how does this translate into the life of that human being? So even the woman that we're talking about, 
and I'm a very strong supporter of women's causes. And you know, we've, uh, I've spent all my life um, supporting women's causes, what I call elite women's causes. We have too many queen bees. How many of you who have become top bankers, top politicians, have actually done anything for those children who are taken out of school? Take our political life. All the debates that happen, governors seeking elections, president seeking elections, senator seeking elections, the topics that are discussed. Can you tell me, when last did you see a debate where politicians talked about what they are going to do about girl child education, about forced marriage, about domestic violence, about the rights of women who are divorced and left with children uncatered for? And why are we surprised if on the streets of Kano or the streets of Zamfara or the streets of Sokoto we see child beggars when we allow their fathers to marry three, four wives and have 22 children on an income that cannot support those families? And if they're on the street, why are we surprised that they go on drugs? And if they go on drugs, why are we surprised that they end up as radicalized individuals? We need to ask ourselves, does this privilege not impose upon us a responsibility? The Chad Basin lost 90% of its water reserves. It didn't lose those reserves overnight. It lost those reserves over decades. Farmlands went waste. Desertification encroached. As far back as 2000, I did a paper in Cape Town, looked at the United Nations Human Development Indices, broke them down, and this is why I say we must look at horizontal inequalities. I broke these down and looked at them state by state. And I remember saying in that paper that if Borno and Yobe were a country of their own, they were poorer than Niger and Cameroon and Chad. But we didn't realize it. So why are we surprised that that area is unstable? We can't run away from the human being. And we can't run away from education. In 1978, when Deng Xiaoping started the opening up in China, there were maybe 30 million graduates in China, if at all. Today, China has more graduates than the entire population of the United States. 700 million Chinese were living in poverty in 1978. That number is down to 30 million. We talk about Chinese miracle. What about an Asian miracle? Why is it a miracle? It's not a miracle. It's just about human beings doing what they needed to do and saying that we are going to build an economy that takes care of our people. China goes to the table to negotiate World Trade Organization, to negotiate international treaties. When it goes to that table, it asks itself, what is good for China? Sorry, this is part of the... <laughs> you see why I'm happy to leave the central bank. I didn't have this. Nobody is first. <laughs> anyway, so when we go for these um, events, when we sign these contracts, we should look between the lines and say, what is it that's going to bring benefit? to the Nigerian on the street. And I think, for me, this is where we have failed. We have failed to bring economics down to earth. And economics can help us, even in the most difficult conversations we're having today. We have a constitution that says we must have a governor and a deputy governor and a state house of assembly in every state, 36 states. 
you have a president and a vice president and a minister from every state. You have 109 senators, over 300 members of the House of Representatives. You have 774 local government chairmen. In each local government, you have 10 councillors and a speaker. A retinue of special advisors and assistants, and you are surprised that you cannot pay salary? I mean, really, we are surprised that we're spending 80, 90% of our revenue on public servants? That's the system we designed. So you want to have a conversation on restructuring? Let us have a conversation. How do you reduce costs of governance without amending this structure? Do we need 40, 30 legislators in every state? Do we need 500 legislators in Abuja? Must we have 36 ministers or more? This is a constitutional conversation. You don't have education. You don't have public health. We've seen the numbers, infant mortality, maternal uh, death at childbirth. Yet, the states and the local governments who are supposed to provide education and health care do not have the lion's share of government revenue. Let's have that conversation. It can be an intelligent dialogue. You don't need to shout Biafra or shout Boko Haram. Let's sit on a table. Let's talk about what works for Nigeria. At the end of the day, devolution is not about ethnicity or religion. Devolution or revenue allocation formula or whatever, it's all about bringing development to the grassroots. And it's a conversation that you should have. But, but, but when, when we cloak this in gender, um, in ethnicity, in religion, then first we lose the opportunity to make progress. And second, we reflect our own ignorance. Because at the end of the day, um, if that is the problem, it will never disappear. If you divide Nigeria into 100 different countries, you will still have multiple ethnicities, multiple religions, and you have to divide those 100 into another 100. And how do you identify yourself? Emeka is a Kano man. We've been friends working in Kano. I don't know. I don't know where, where, where Emeka comes from. I don't know. I, I don't think. I don't think he considers himself as coming from anywhere other than he's just a human being. He's an individual. So let's change this conversation, and I'm hoping that um, as we talk about this economy, and as we talk about, and again, uh, this is not something that is targeted at any particular individual, but we need, we need to think about the way colonialism has left us and the way we have voluntarily remained in a post-colonial mindset. The British came here and set up a colony. What did they want? They wanted raw materials and a market for their goods. We don't have the British today, but we're still exporting our crude oil to Britain and importing petroleum products. They don't even need to have colonial officers. We do need ourselves. We're keeping their refineries open. The greatest, the largest export of the United Kingdom to Nigeria is what? Petroleum products. And we are an oil producing country. So I'm happy somebody is building a refinery. I'm happier that person is from Kano. But we need to have more. Why should we export cotton to China and import textile products? Why should we export our hides and skin and import shoes? And, you know, this is not rocket science. Ethiopia told the Chinese, gentlemen, come. What do you need to set up a factory here? They told them. They invited them. They set up a factory right there outside Addis, employing 5,000 people, producing shoes and bags, and selling to Yves Saint Laurent and Gucci. And, you know, the leather in Kano is called Moroccan leather, the best leather in the world. Come and set up the factory in Kano. And the skin we don't sell, we sell to Lagos, pepper soup. 
we consume our own GDP. It's a delicacy. We've got to look at these things. And they're simple. You know, the Chinese didn't start building rockets. We're not talking about building computers, which is, which is great to think about it, or building Aston Martin cars. No, please. Okay? Why don't you just turn your cotton into fabric, turn your fabric into garment and sell? Turn your hides and skin into leather, turn your leather into shoes and bags. And we used to do this centuries ago. 17th century, Kano was exporting shoes and bags, trans-Sahara, to the Arab world, $5 million worth in the 18th century. Economic history, 100 years of data on Nigerian trade before colonialism. In only 15 years did we have a trade deficit. What happened? What changed? Why is Ethiopia doing it? Why is Cote d'Ivoire doing it? Why is Ghana doing it? Why is Morocco doing it? We are the giant of Africa, a giant with clay feet. So we must first of all stop being in denial. And the way to wake up is to look not at the people in this room, because you do not represent Nigeria. We do not represent Nigeria. For every young northern Muslim girl like her, there are millions who did not even complete primary education. And they're walking around with wares, trading. They get married off without their consent. They produce children, they get beaten. After some time, they get divorced. And I'm talking about what I know, what I deal with every day. Four or five children. Somebody wakes up and says, I divorce you. Go home. Her father sent her, maybe the father, as we heard from Miss Graham Douglas, maybe when the father married her off, he thought he was taking a burden off him, of himself, taking off one daughter. She comes back with a baggage of six that he did not produce, that he has to take care of, and his income has not gone up. Which is fine, but what is bad about it is that our system does not even see this as a problem, and the system does not protect them. Now, who is going to protect them? It's us. It's those of us who have been privileged to get this education, to give our daughters this education, to have our sisters with this education, we are the ones responsible for protecting those voiceless majority. And we have failed in that. And you know, today you go out in your car and they're hailing you, in 20 years, they will start carrying stones. Because those young people that you see on the street are going to be young men and young women without an education or without jobs. So you tell me there's no prosperity without peace? I say to you, there's no peace without prosperity. 